Mr. Gomer. Thank you. Um, Director Ray, we know from the Arizona case, the Supreme Court said that uh, state local law enforcement were not to enforce immigration laws. But isn't it true that local and state law enforcement officers can enforce state and local law if, uh, even if the, uh, the defendant is uh, in the country illegally? Well, I want to be a little bit careful since I, uh, the last time I looked at that issue was back in the uh, 2001 2 3 range when I was a, a lawyer at the Justice Department. But Look, my, recollection my time is, is very short. My recollection it's an easy is question. Similar to yours. My, my recollection is similar to yours, but I'm yes. not speaking well, as a lawyer right now. Okay, it is the case, and I hope you'll refresh your recollection and your legal training. So uh, it seems that since the federal government is welcoming basically by its tactics, by its handling of the massive surge across our border um, in such a way to continue to encourage it that uh, uh, there is massive destruction to landowners' property. It sounds like understanding the criminal trespass laws of Texas that perhaps landowners on the border ought to have no trespassing signs, including in Spanish so that local law enforcement can protect the country um, while they're protecting the local property owners. Uh, there was a question about uh, also the, um, the FISA court, and I'm still, as a former judge, particularly disturbed that no FISA judge um, felt strongly enough about uh, people not lying in applications for warrants that they took action for contempt of court, but should DOJ officials that sign applications for warrants before the FISA court actually read them before they certify that they're true and correct? Um, certainly it's my practice when, I, when as FBI director, I'm signing applications to- You do read them. them. I do review them, yes, absolutely. And I would commend you for that. And I would ask you to look in. They're not short, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, they're yeah. usually lengthy. Yeah. But I would uh, commend your looking into uh, Mr. Rosenstein's uh, inability to uh, testify that he uh, actually read those uh, regarding the Trump campaign before he signed them. Um, the night before January 6th, January 5th, that evening I was talking to Capitol Police officers and I said, you know, let's face it, uh, most of the conservatives that come, they don't have any intention of being violent. And they said, well, we've been briefed today that uh, there's a good bit of, uh, it's understood, online activity, that there are people that are going to be coming that hate Trump, but they're going to dress up in red, MAGA, Trump, paraphernalia to try to blend in and create trouble. Um, we had Capitol Police Chief Sun testify that uh, they got no information from U.S. Intel or from the DOJ, FBI, of any threat of the nature that came about. Did the FBI have information about the violent threat that occurred on January 6th, on January 5th? Well, the answer to that is complicated, unfortunately. So we have the, we've already talked about a little bit here this morning. It shouldn't be complicated. You either had information or you didn't. That was my question. Different, so there's different kinds of information. We had the online chatter that we just talked about and the Norfolk, so-called Norfolk SIR situational information report has that. But what we did not have, to my did knowledge- Did you pass any of that information on to Chief uh, Sund? We passed the Norfolk information onto the Capitol Police in three different ways, uh, as well as to- Okay, MPD. well you were careful to note that most of the protesters who were leftists last summer uh, were basically peaceful, but you haven't said that about the 100, 200,000 people that showed up on January 6th. Do you know how many people actually came into the Capitol on January 6th 
uh, that were unauthorized? I don't have an exact number. I do know that we've uh, now uh, are approaching around 500 arrests. But to be clear, to your point about peaceful, the way I, I think is a fair description of January 6th is there's sort of three groups of people, almost like an inverse pyramid. First group, biggest number of people who showed up kind of outside, maybe not on the Capitol grounds, uh, were peaceful, maybe rowdy, but peaceful protesters. Then there's a second group that were people who, uh, for whatever reason, engaged in, let's say, the next level of criminal conduct, trespass, et cetera. Uh, and that is criminal, that is a violation, and it needs, those laws need to be enforced. And then there's the third group, uh, which is where you're seeing a lot of the arrests and a lot of the more significant charges that are coming out of our work right now, which are the people who brought all sorts of weapons, uh, you know, Kevlar, tactical vests, uh, you know, bear spray. Firearms? What's that? Anybody bring you get, firearms? We, we, uh, do we have, I can think of at least one instance where there was an individual with a gun inside the Capitol, but for the most part, the weapons were weapons other than firearms. But General, there's three groups, and it's hard to paint with one broad brush every single individual. The gentleman's time has expired. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm a you know, huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated, he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. 
There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.